All right. Interesting way to close out Raw tonight. People are already assuming that Drew McIntyre is now a member of the Judgment Day. Uh, you know, not so fast, everyone. Not so fast. Um, this is going to be very interesting to lead into Survivor Series. Uh, there is news that I will share, and this is credited to Fightful. They pretty much have this confirmed that Randy Orton is a lock for Survivor Series. Now, the interesting thing about it is earlier in the day, their reports added that Drew McIntyre is going to be the fifth man on the team of the Judgment Day, and that announcement is going to take place on the SmackDown. Well, actually, I, sh I should say Randy Orton will be revealed during the SmackDown go-home show to the Survivor Series. Now, uh, I personally, I, I read the Randy Orton report on Fightful. That I know for sure. I don't recall hearing about the Randy Orton announcement taking place at the go-home of SmackDown because that doesn't make sense. And I have a feeling some websites kind of like added their own spin to things because why would Nick Aldis reveal Randy Orton on a team that consists of only raw wrestlers? Doesn't make sense. Um, the second thing is Drew McIntyre has an issue with Jey Uso more than anything else. Gets a little confusing earlier in the day when Drew McIntyre shakes hands with Seth Rollins. Now, obviously, next week on Raw, Seth Rollins will have a problem with Drew McIntyre and what he did tonight. Um, I don't think Seth Rollins cares all that much about Cody Rhodes not necessarily becoming a tag team champion because remember earlier today, Cody said to Seth, look, we could feud 364 days out of the year, but I need you for Survivor Series. And at Survivor Series, Seth Rollins gives his word. Seth Rollins will not go back on his word at this time. So Judgment Day, Drew McIntyre, it's a little confusing right now. Um, I will tell you that I was told the scenario involving Randy Orton for Survivor Series that is a lot different than what is floating around. We're going to talk about that on Saturday. And the reason why I want to wait until Saturday is because I want to see what goes down on SmackDown Friday. But if this scenario pans out, it's going to be really interesting. I think we all agree that War Games has to be five on five. You know, I think four on four is a little bit watered down. I mean, you look at traditional Survivor Series teams, you know, I, five on five. I mean, that that's the template. So, you know, they got to add Drew McIntyre to this or someone else. Now, my biggest problem with all of this is something that we've been talking about since Fastlane. What was the purpose of Rhea Ripley having an agreement with Paul Heyman and having an alliance with the bloodline? If Jimmy Uso has nothing, what what's going to happen? I mean, are Jimmy Uso, I, I can't see Solo Sokoa doing it, but is Jimmy Uso going to just show up at the cage during war games and feed weapons to the judgment day. Is that the bloodline judgment day Alliance? That's the extent of it. That's weak, man. That's weak. You don't need this Alliance storyline for Jimmy Uso to want to see his brother get his ass kicked right now. So don't you feel, I mean, look, obviously a swerve is something we all like. And Drew McIntyre coming out at the end of the night, most of us did not expect that to happen. But doesn't it make more sense for Jimmy Uso to be on that team and not Drew McIntyre? Doesn't mean I don't want to see Drew McIntyre in that position. But if this scenario pans out and they stick with a four-on-four, four, Something may happen completely different at Survivor Series. We'll talk about that on Saturday. But I want to welcome everyone to this Raw Post Show. I am Don Tony. Today is November 13th, 2023. Uh, just 
Two very quick plugs, if you're not aware of it already. Well, one, you're definitely not aware of. But first and foremost, tomorrow, Kev Castle and yours truly are going to do a special episode of the Don, Tony, and Kevin Castle show. If you'd like to join us live, we do it live whenever we do these on our Patreon. And then the recorded episode goes on DonTony.com for everyone. We start live tomorrow at 10.05. Now, something else that we're going to do. We originally were going to do it next week, but it being Thanksgiving, and I will be away for four days, and I'm sure a lot of you are going to be spending Thanksgiving with your family. The following week, the last week in November, Kevin and I are going to record a Q&A episode. You know those Q&A with Don Tony episodes that we do? We're going to do a Q&A, uh, the Don Tony and Kevin Castle version. We will post a thread in the community section on YouTube. And yes, Don Tony, I want to make this clear. Don Tony and Kevin Castle show episodes do not pop up on YouTube. But the reason why we're putting the thread in the community section there is so everybody can visibly see it. It's not fair to only post it on Patreon. I don't want to do email because then you get into this problem where multiple people will send similar questions so if something is visible that everybody could see, then, uh, you know, if you see someone else already posted a question, you could post something different. And we are going to limit the question to like one or two because we know that this response is going to be massive. I think this is the first Q&A that Kevin and I have done le legitimately in about six or seven years. So uh, that thread will be up in the next day or two. So just you'll get the alert if you're if you're a subscriber to the channel, not even a member, but if you're a subscriber, you'll get the alert that the thread is posted. So I think that's a pretty cool plug to let everybody know about. Uh, a couple other things before we go over Raw a little bit. Raw was kind of a mixed bag tonight. There was a lot of things that I truthfully feel we could have skipped. Some of it was kind of sloppy. You know, I'm not sure how I feel about Gunther suddenly happy with Giovanni Vinci. You know, I know WWE sees money in Ludwig Kaiser as a singles. And remember the match. Remember the match from about three or four weeks ago. Remember when they showed that one-time video package of Kaiser and they were focusing on his chiseled body. They had a close-up on his nipples. And they were really... There is a lot of push for Ludwig Kaiser versus Gunther match because Gunther doesn't have this plethora of opponents on Raw that they could just keep throwing at him and throwing at him. Once you go through the Miz, you know, you start thinking to yourself, okay, what's next for Gunther? You get into the Royal Rumble, you get into Elimination Chamber, you get into the road of WrestleMania. Something has to be bigger for Gunther. And the tease that Kaiser gets in the face of Gunther or vice versa, and that leads to a match, that's happening. It's just a matter of when. Now, something else that before we get into the whole Raw thing, I think it's this is a good uh, thing we could bring up right now. There is a lot, a lot of buzz about Shinsuke Nakamura's promo tonight on Raw. And the reason why it got so much buzz is because if you've paid attention for the last two weeks, you know, there's little innuendos that he is, you know, looking for somebody. And the way it was portrayed tonight, Randy Orton trended all over social media after Nakamura's promo, yes, Randy Orton trended earlier in the day. I'm not saying that he didn't, but Nakamura, he was cutting a promo tonight to pre recorded in the dark red room. He's in Alistair Black's old room, and he's talking about someone being blessed with so much privilege. I hope my intelligent friends out there pick up on where I'm leading to this because I think it, I, we, we, pretty much know who Nakamura is talking about. But he talks about this person being slow, so blessed with privilege. So now he is taking away his choice. And these distractions have not taken my focus off of you. I will wait 
for now. And after that promo, all over the net, you saw Nakamura. He's calling out Randy Orton. I don't mean it to be disrespectful. I'll run down the street naked with just pasties around my private parts and film it if I'm wrong uh, about this. When I say it is not Randy Orton because scoops have talked about a Randy Orton return. WWE has not even teased the Randy Orton return. When Randy Orton showed up at the Performance Center, shh, don't record me, shh, don't say anything. Randy Orton's been at the Performance Center more than once. It just, it's just that he's only been caught on camera once. Randy Orton is cleared. Randy Orton is returning. But the idea that wrestlers think that he's returning know that he's returning and someone like Nakamura is teasing that he's calling him out. That's just, I don't even think AEW would do a weak storyline like that. Can you all figure out who Nakamura is talking about? Can we all figure it out? Now, my gut feeling, it's easy. It's easy. Cody Rhodes. Remember, he teamed up with Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins back earlier this year, and then he turned on Seth Rollins. There was never a feud with Cody Rhodes. You talk about privilege. You talk about distractions. It, in my opinion, Shinsuke Nakamura versus Cody Rhodes is on the horizon. You need somebody for Cody outside of the judgment day between now and Royal Rumble. I think Shinsuke Nakamura is that person especially when you think of privilege. You know, who does comes across more about privilege? He's a Rhodes. Randy Orton returning has nothing to do with privilege right now. In fact, news reports today were even dispelling news that was never news. Did you see that dumb shit today? Oh, rumor killer. Randy Orton, when he's returning, he's not going after a title. Who fucking reported that in the first place? Nobody reported that. I love when people kill rumors that were never made in the first place. And by the way, I got to show you this. We always call out dirt bags that will do anything to get you to click on this stuff. And the newest phase, the newest tease is purposely writing wrong information. And we have zoomed in onto one website that is on Microsoft, that is on Google News, that is getting all of this ad revenue from fraud. Honestly, I think this is fraud. I want to show you the latest example of just absolute garbage. Now, I know some of you out there are not going to pick up on this right away, but I want you to see the latest bullshit that these people pulled out. Sorry, Nakamura, I got to take you off the screen for a moment. <laughs> Brock Lesnar, WWE comeback, scheduled for the upcoming year. All right. We talked about that three weeks ago. That That is legit. But when you read this article, for those on video, you could see this. But for those on audio, let me read you the three sentences, four sentences that this place is reporting. And this is the same place that has been writing all of this wrong information. And you have people telling them, no, bro, you got this wrong. You made a mistake. You did this wrong. And they're doing it on purpose. They're never fixing it. The latest, check this out. I actually had to take a double, you know, like you take a step back and a double take. Like, wait, it's, is my history kind of like, uh, clouding my brain. It says Brock Lesnar, a renowned figure in the WWE universe, is set for a highly anticipated return with his comeback already scheduled for early next year. Uh, having wrestled his last match at SummerSlam against Cody Rhodes, Lesnar has since has since been on a break from the ring. Okay, so far, nothing wrong with the article, right? He, here's where it gets into fraud. However, Fans could look forward to his reemergence at the WWE Royal Rumble event. 
The WWE Royal Rumble is slated for January 27th, 2024 at Tropicana Field in St. Petersburg, Florida. The event is significant as it marks the return of live audiences to the Royal Rumble for the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic. Did you hear that last part? This marks the first time the Royal Rumble returns to live fans since the COVID-19 pandemic. This junk wrestling world, I, I can't believe that this is not fraud, just flat out fraud, because they keep doing this stuff. And yes, I know some people can say, well, DT, you're bringing attention to it. Yeah, I am bringing attention to it because they're not the only ones. They're just the biggest ones out there. But you see even the rumor killer about Randy Orton in a championship, nobody reported that. So you got people putting up wrong things so people click on it to say, dude, no, we had fans last year. We had fans the year before. This just wanted to show you the latest garbage. Absolute garbage. Who's the schmuck that did this one? What's his name? Norman Rafouf. Rauf? Rauf. Norman Rauf. I don't know who he is. I don't know where he's from. But you are a fucking fraud. By the way, how did you like Natty cosplaying as Zack Ryder at the beginning? It's, I, I'm assuming she dressed up as Zack Ryder for Halloween. Why this only showed up on TikTok video today? I have no idea. But she did an incredible job. Incredible job. I thought she did great doing that. Um, all right. I want to get into a couple other tidbits of news. This is only going to take me about five minutes. I think the news is big enough to talk about and then we'll talk about raw quick plug for the history show this week and we'll get out of here obviously everybody's talking about today is the anniversary of eddie guerrero passing away this week's history show we obviously pay tribute and also for those that go back many years the night that eddie passed i actually opened up my hotline and allowed fans to leave messages about their greatest memories of Eddie Guerrero. And I still have that recorded from when Eddie passed away. And one of the persons that called as a caller, his name was Kevin from Sheepshead Bay. And uh, that Kevin from Sheepshead Bay ended up being my co-host from 2000 and what, four, four to the, pretty much the present. So very, very beautiful tribute. We'll get into the history show a little bit later. Uh, Two weeks from today, two weeks from today, Tammy Sitch will be sentenced. Uh, yeah, I used the play on my preview. It's going to be judgment day for Tammy Sitch. Now, I am I know this is going to sound dirtbaggish on my part. You know, kind of the old school Don Tony kicked in a little bit today because my first instinct was was to do a predictions contest. Let everybody predict what her jail sentence is going to be. I actually had that written and I deleted it. And I'm like, you know what? She fucking killed someone. I don't think this is time for games. I don't even think it's just anybody should celebrate that she could spend the rest of her life in prison. This is a tragedy across the board. It's a tragedy that she took someone's life. It's a tragedy that she has abused drugs and alcohol and now food. Let's be honest. I mean, I, I should talk, but, uh, you know, it's a tragedy across the board. 1995, you know, she was the most downloaded woman on social media. That was the moniker. And she was, you know, the talk and just totally, you know what the worst part is? And we've talked about this before. This is what happens many times when you are a celebrity. I mean, the, the interesting thing, though, is you see, like, we, we've talked about Reed Flair in the past, and that is awful what happened to him, you know. And I remember when we posted back in the DTKC show days, the three faces of, of Flair, and it was the three mugshots of Reed. And what happened was law enforcement kept going light on the guy because he was Ric Flair's son. And sometimes you got to hit rock bottom in order to pick yourself up. But for some people, sometimes you hit rock bottom, you can't pick yourself up. That's why we, we always, you know, just had so much sympathy for Jared King Lawler and the passing of Brian Christopher. 
you know, what happened to him. He hit rock bottom and he couldn't deal with it. Tammy Sitch, you know, this is way past her prime. And why Pennsylvania and Jersey gave her so many breaks, it doesn't make sense. I mean, you would think that this, look, I didn't even know about every little DUI that she had until about a month ago when the, when the prosecutor, you know, gave his closing arguments. And I was like, you know, like that should be an investigation. Like, why would the court system keep giving her a pass? You know, this is, you know, this death to this guy could have been preventable. But in two weeks, she will be sentenced. In two weeks from tonight, we will be talking about it. Um, as I said before, my guess, 12 to 16 years. She's facing, I think, even a little bit more than 25 years in prison. My gut says 12 to 16. I think that is pretty much the range. I'd be surprised if it's more. I'd be shocked if it's less. But two weeks from today, mark it down. This Friday, mark it down as well. This Friday, we will be having <laughs> AEW versus WWE head-to-head -head once again. And the elite media sites already preparing for disaster. Uh, collision. I honestly don't understand. I don't understand why you would air collision on a Friday night at 8 p.m. I know full gear is Saturday, but I know why they're doing it. For those that, that are going to listen, WWE could have a go home show on a Friday for a SmackDown, and two days later, you could have a pay per view on a Sunday. All right. I know a lot of pay per views lately have been on a Saturday. The, you say to yourself, why even do a collision on a Friday night when the next night is full gear? I will tell you from the people that I talk to, the reason why collision, they are doing one Friday. And honestly, I got to use the D word, disorganization. They did not, they want to announce additional matches on Friday. They want to progress some storylines that really haven't been pushed hard for full gear. They don't, they, they should have balanced it better that to Wednesday's dynamite was the go home show to full gear. Even if you want to do rampage, why not just do rampage at 10 o'clock or do a special collision at 10 o'clock, not even do a collision, but they want to add that additional time because they did not prepare. They need the extra show to try to convince people to buy full gear. And people are already preparing for disaster. Because if you look at the elite media sites, they added a, a, a cute little two-sentence paragraph after the report that this Friday collision and SmackDown go head-to-head. -head. They said that WWE has an unfair advantage because they are on Fox whilst... Collision is on a cable channel. Every time Dynamite, Collision, Rampage, Raw, SmackDown, NXT is on TV, it goes up against regular television, ABC, CBS, NBC, wherever. So now because it's Collision versus Fox, it's an unfair, what fucking unfair advantage so you're telling me that any broadcast network show that's not on cable gives any cable show an unfair advantage? That doesn't even make sense, but be prepared. I will have next week the Monday, the Friday Night War banner made up. We will see what the ratings will be. I just, I just think this was disorganization on AEW's part. I think they should have just kept their 10 o'clock show because fans are going to buy full gear are going to buy full gear. How many fans truly are going to, after Friday night at 8 o'clock, going to say, you know what? I'm buying full gear. I mean, how many people do you really think? Why deal with the embarrassment that SmackDown's going to get probably like $2.3 million and Collision's probably going to get like 377000 You know, and then people are going to use that as trolling. You know, why even bother? 
why have any negativity leading into your full gear? But that's coming this Friday. So be prepared. Be prepared. Also, a little programming note, tribute to the troops. Uh, Friday, December 8th, that's when tribute to the troops will air. That is a SmackDown. So they are doing a SmackDown, a tribute to the troops themed SmackDown. This will not air on like an NBC. This is not airing on a Saturday or a Sunday. It is going to air Friday, December 8th at 8 p.m. in SmackDown's time slot. So you might want to make a note of that. Uh, WWE House Show results this weekend. Uh, and this will lead to a couple of reports we talk about Saturday. They are testing out a few matches for few future feuds. Cody Rhodes uh, took on The Miz, which people found very, very interesting because technically it was both babyface and there was a lot of respect shown towards each other after. That match is not going to be airing on TV, but WWE is starting to prepare for Seth Rollins versus Drew McIntyre. They did that at the house shows this weekend. Very well received. Crowd ended up solidly behind Seth Rollins by the time the match ended. And now after what happened on Raw tonight, you know, they're going to push this even further. The big question is, when do we go from what happened tonight on Raw to Seth Rollins versus Drew McIntyre rematch for the World Heavyweight Championship? Oh, I, I want to bring it up now, but we got to wait till Saturday because if I bring it up now, it's a little premature and it may not actually end up happening. But uh, there is a swerve that could be coming and that may end up leading into Randy Orton returning because I, I'll give you this for now. Something is going to happen prior to Survivor Series that will explain why. Remember when Ray made a phone call and he got Carlito at Fastlane? Remember that? Technically, someone else is going to make a phone call and Randy Orton is going to appear. Randy Orton's just not going to happen to be in the back, in gear, oiled up, ready to be in Survivor Series. Something is going to happen on television prior to that, and then Randy will be called, and it will be a surprise. And we will see. Uh, I want to just talk one more thing, and then we'll get into Raw and the history show, and we'll get out of here. Logan Paul. Logan Paul this weekend got a lot of attention uh, about the United States Championship. Do you remember about three weeks ago when we started, when we brought up that Logan Paul was going to be fighting for the United States Championship? This was before he even made the challenge to Rey Mysterio. One thing that we talked about back then, and I know that you'll all remember that tune in, is that what we were afraid of is that WWE is going to turn the United States Championship into the 24-7 title for a little while. No, Logan Paul is not going to be defending the championship on a radio show, drinking his prime energy drinks, working out in the gym, but it was going to be, the title was going to be treated as a prop. And that's what we were fearing with the 24-7 title. Do you remember, I think it was uh, someone in Glacius, stole like a championship and where's this title and where you, you remember all that dumb shit i think it was the 24-7 the title we were fearing that the united states championship would be turned into a prop well well he and by the way i just did hawk this week in wrestling history is the anniversary of when hawk fell off the titan tron and i hadn't watched that clip in good 20 years and I do not remember that Draws fucking pushed him off. For some reason over the years, we maybe because of, you know, Hawk's, you know, s issues with, you know, substances. You know, not hardcore, but he had some issues, obviously. You know, over the years, we started, I think, believing that Hawk, you know, they were just working on his inebriation and he fell off the Titan Tron because he was either, you know, on something. But you watch it back, fucking draws, just pushed his ass off the Titan Tron. And Jim Ross, God bless him at the time. Jim Ross is like, you know, I hope that wasn't deliberate. I mean, hope it wasn't deliberate. He literally just pushed him off the thing. <laughs> it was just funny to watch it back. Uh, but Logan Paul, um, if you missed it over the weekend, Logan Paul has been seen quite a bit with this United States Championship. 
He was at the UFC event. He actually shouted out Dominic Mysterio. That was legit. Dominic Mysterio shouted him back. I got to figure out how you could do that on your phone. That's pretty cool. Maybe that's just maybe a picture file. That might just be a picture file with text drawn on it. But Dominic's looked the same. But okay, nothing wrong with showing up at UFC with the WWE United States Championship. But went a little bit further. Uh, Logan Paul took a shower with the championship. Now, I will tell you, even though this is not reported, I didn't even write it in synopsis because this is not news. I would be guilty of what I always rip others for doing. I will tell you this now. Uh, Logan Paul actually was wearing something underneath the title. Uh, because immediately people like, oh, his junk is, you know, on the championship. He actually was wearing something underneath. I want to make that clear. But also, he actually, they took pictures of him in bed with his fiance holding the championship. And he actually went further and did an interview. And they were kind of insinuating that he was doing a page with the championship. Uh, not blowing loads on the belt but insinuating that, you know, he could be wearing it and having sex. Uh, but supposedly there is a no fucking rule, as he called it, with the championship belt. But Logan Paul, if you go on social media, my friends, Logan Paul is not the most popular person out there. You know, we appreciate and we respect how hard he commits himself to wrestling and he's been doing a damn good job at it. But people that didn't like him already really got triggered. At this and there's other photos that I haven't even put online. And if you want another one, that's a treat. Logan Paul went to a hawk shop, a hawk shop. You know, when you like hawk things, you sell it like a jewelry, like hot shot. And uh, this is what happened earlier today. I wanted to see how much I could get for this. That's a WWE United States Championship. You might be allowed to buy this? I mean, if you have a good offer. I don't know the history behind this belt, but I do know that it was taken off of Rey Mysterio. He's a legend. How much? I'd do 100, 100,000 for this. Oh, careful now, it's a US title. Who was supposed to buy from I don't know, maybe Cody Rhodes walks in here. Maybe Seth Rollins walks in here. There's a guy by the name of LA Knight. Yeah. Yeah. For sure as damn hell, he ain't getting it from me. <laughs> How does it look on me? Like this, like kind of like, yes. kind of like gangster yes, like this? Yes, My, yes, yes. He sent the picture to his niece. All right, that's enough, that's enough. Uh, by the way, um, yesterday on the sit down, somebody talked about LA Knight versus Logan Paul. L.A. Knight could be the one to take the United States Championship off for Logan Paul. But there is someone else that is going to get involved with Logan Paul first. We actually talked about it two weeks ago. Uh, actually, a week and a half ago when Logan Paul first won the United States Championship. Uh, and that person is going to be Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens, even though they're doing a suspension angle right now, they're doing a suspension angle right now because there's nothing for him for Survivor Series. We've already talked about that on Saturday. But Kevin Owens is going to be very, very upset at the way Logan Paul is treating the United States Championship. We talked about that a week and a half ago. And kind of on Friday, if you saw when Kevin Owens was doing commentating and they were showing the NFL championship titles, he took a shot at Logan Paul. So what Logan Paul is doing right now, he's not trying to disrespect WWE, but he's disrespecting the championship that Rey Mysterio held. And Kevin Owens is going to speak up and he's going to feud with Logan Paul. So that's something to look forward to. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Kevin Owens will be the one to dethrone Logan Paul. But, you know, Saturday we'll talk a little bit more about the LA Knight Logan Paul factor and when that match could go down uh you know early reports is Royal Rumble um high profile match at the Royal Rumble uh and that would be really interesting because if LA Knight is not in the Royal Rumble match but instead he has a United States title shot that night against Logan Paul you don't get that Logan Paul moment in the Royal Rumble match but you also dispel all the people that are going to say LA Knight should win the Royal Rumble. Cody could win Chamber. You know, like, you know that you're going to get that. 
So if LA Knight starts a feud with Logan Paul a couple of weeks before Royal Rumble, we could get that shit out of the way and we don't have to deal with that stuff online. But so the Logan Paul stuff right now, understand they're doing it to get fans outraged at Logan Paul. Kevin Owens is going to defend the lineage of the United States Championship. He's going to defend the lineage, you know, just the WWE itself. And um, he's going to call out Logan Paul. We might see a stunner out of nowhere, you know, but uh, that's coming. Kevin Owens and Logan Paul is coming. So get ready for it. And that'll be fun. That'll be a lot of fun. All right. Let me clear out my Logan Paul stuff. And let's talk a little bit about Raw tonight. Raw tonight had a lot of good, a lot of bad, a lot of rinse and repeat. Uh, We opened up Raw tonight with team Cody for war games. And, you know, I don't, I mean, I get it. Cody and Seth fought for the world heavyweight championship. I get it. You know, they teamed up not too long ago. Uh, You know, the idea that we're supposed to believe that there's this much dissension still between Seth and Cody You know, I I almost feel like this is trying to rewrite history because they've actually teamed up and actually had a shared a lot of handshakes, not a lot, but enough over the last six months. I think it's fair to say that why they're teasing this much dissension, you know, this point is a little bit tiresome and Sami Zayn being in the middle. Meanwhile, you know, Jey Uso is just hanging in the back. Yeet, yeet. Yeet. Speaking of yeet, somebody who was live at Raw tonight was sitting in the rafters and recorded a little bit of Jey Uso's intro. And I have it. And I'm going to share it with you. Only because, you know, it's it's fun to see the fans interact with with fan, you know, with wrestlers. And some of the Dominic Mysterio stuff, WWE is laid off on the heavy piping in of the volume tonight. Dominic's uh, booze were pretty legit. But, um, you know, I just look at this with Jey Uso's intro and I say to myself, my arms would be spaghetti. They would be rubber afterwards. They ain't no way that I am doing this if I'm a fan. My, Could you just imagine if you're out of shape and you go to Raw Imagine how your arms feel afterwards, especially if you want to try to like masturbate or maybe like tie your shoes or put on a pair of socks after doing this for 30 seconds. I like how the crowd is into it, but my arms would be killing me by now. Yeah, that was earlier today. My arms would be killing me if I did did it for that long. But uh, we opened up with Team Cody in the ring. They're hyping up Survivor Series. And Cody is on the mic. And, you know, Seth and Cody tease a little bit of dissension. And they get interrupted by the Judgment Day. And something happened with the Judgment Day. Well, two things happened today that were pretty big. First off was the Judgment Day hits the ring with J.D. McDonough. And, you know, they're throwing insults. And Damian Priest is talking about Cody Rhodes and how he could beat everybody in the ring except for the champion. You know, and and that's a double shot because, yes, Cody beat Seth Rollins a couple of times when Cody first came back. But Seth Rollins is the world heavyweight champion right now. So Damian Priest taking a shot at Cody for also the Roman Reigns factor, obviously. and. They're jawjacking against each other. And once again, they bring up that mommy is not there and mommy is the leader of the Judgment Day. And even though this is going to be a turning point for Damian Priest's future in the Judgment Day, it was forced, pretty forced, because Damian Priest out of nowhere just blurts out like, yeah, I'm the leader of the Judgment Day. I'm the leader. He anoints himself the leader of the judgment day and Finn Balor has got this look like, what the fuck did you say? You know, Dominic and JD had some looks as well, but JD is not a member of the judgment day 
at this time. And then Cody and Seth Rollins, they're in the ring and they're exchanging back and forth. And because Jay and Cody have a match already tonight, a rematch for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships, Seth Rollins has an idea. Him and Sami Zayn take on Dominic Mysterio and J.D. McDonough. And Damian Priest, proclaiming himself the leader of the Judgment Day, says, we accept. And Dom and J.D. are looking at him like, what are you talking about? All Damian Priest did was what Rhea Ripley would normally do, right? So Dominic and J.D. have a match against Sami Zayn and Seth Rollins. That is the impromptu match for tonight. And the match ends in a DQ because the other members of the Judgment Day, Damian Priest, Finn Balor, and Rhea Ripley hit the ring, and they're causing loads of chaos. You know, obviously disarray to hype up war games that these wrestlers cannot contain themselves. They cannot control themselves. Adam Pierce, you know, yes, very forced in the last two weeks. Adam Pierce now acting like he is uh, constipated, angry, you know, just road rage. He is fed up. He is fucking fed up with all of them. He is fed up with the Judgment Day interference. And he's sick and tired of the outcomes and people always getting involved in the matches. And he says that tonight, that's not going to happen with the title match. The fans deserve better. So all members that are not in the match are banned from ringside. Rhea Ripley fucking freaks out. Rhea Ripley reading the Riot Act to Adam Pierce, Adam Pierce, grow cry me a river. I don't give a shit. And then uh, all the fans went to buy pretzels because honestly, I know I was kind of harsh about Zoe Stark last week, but we talked about it on Saturday. Her winning that battle royal in the confrontation with Rhea Ripley last week led to a 350,000 viewership drop. The fans are not into Zoe Stark versus Rhea Ripley. They are not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. Sorry, the wrong person is getting the match. Zoe, give her credit. She's trying hard. You know, and they're using the one liners, Rhea Ripley saying to Zoe that the only way you're winning a title is if you're on the other brand. And oh, I've been watching you. I've been watching you since NXT, and I know what you can do. And Zoe, you know, talking about, oh, I, I beat you, or I could beat you, and I can take that down. The fans just don't give a fuck. They're trying their hardest, but the fans just don't care. They just, the crowd is just fucking dead, deader than dead with this. You know, I like Zoe Stark. And again, I know I'm repeating myself, but I've said before when she was in NXT, I said she went to the top of my list that she could go to the main roster. WWE Creative has done a shit job with Zoe Stark. And the way they did the Trish Stratus thing, it did not help her in the end. And in the end, a lot of us felt that the, 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 it was turned the wrong way. Trish should have been the baby face. Zoe should have been the heel. Zoe doesn't have that charisma yet that the fans want to stand behind her and root for her. It just isn't working. And how it feels right now, and, and I've kind of like compared this before, but it's like if you're a kid, you're a little kid, and you're getting ready to eat dinner, and your mom or your dad or your guardian like puts on the table like cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and calves liver, and you're like, ah, oh, I don't want that. You shut up and you enjoy it or you're grounded. You're like, you're forced to enjoy it. Like you have to act like you enjoy it. No, this is what it feels like. You know, WWE creative has done a shit job with Zoe Stark. And now we're all supposed to believe suspension of disbelief. Remember what I said last week? And I was saying it in defense of Zoe Stark, Chicago is going to eat her alive. Even today, when Rhea Ripley is cutting a promos and the fans always, you know, into mommy ends up always on top and little sexual, you know, innuendos and they're cheering for it tonight. And she's like, cheer for me if you want. But Zoe Stark, there's nothing about, even later on when she's talking to Shayna in the back 
And then Raquel's got a little bit of support. And then Nia Jax, oh, oh, good luck. You know, it's like, it's not helping Zoe Stark in any way whatsoever. And honestly, any balloon that was filled up with the Judgment Day and Team Cody leading up to Rhea Ripley having that confrontation with Zoe today, whatever air inflated in that balloon, Zoe popped it. It popped. That crowd was fucking dead after that. Honestly, when we go into the ratings this Wednesday, I guarantee fucking to you there's about a 200,000 plus viewership drop at that particular moment. It just, it's not working. And I really feel, I hope Zoe Stark puts on a performance of a lifetime and she wins those fans over. But right now, Rhea Ripley's too badass and Chicago is already a little bit interesting with their support and they're going to eat her fucking alive. I mean, she'll handle it, but did not like, did not like any of that at all today. Didn't like it at all. So after this, this is when we had the Shinsuke Nakamura segment. And again, as I said earlier, I think Shinsuke Nakamura is calling out Cody Rhodes. And I think that's where we're leading after this. I think after war games, Cody goes to Shinsuke, Seth goes to Drew. And then after that, we lead to Royal Rumble and we see what happens. I think Seth Rollins in the Royal Rumble, not as a champion, could very well be a possibility. Or you have Drew McIntyre versus Seth Rollins at the Royal Rumble for the World Heavyweight Championship. Okay, so after that match and after the Shinsuke Nakamura segment, um, we had Otis taking on Shinsuke Nakamura. And this this match is a little too small. That's better. Otis, you know, it's rinse and repeat with Otis. Otis is over with the crowd. Alpha Academy does great. You know, this doesn't say shoosh. This is chooch. I don't know if you can see chooch. Chooch! Chooch! Otis and Nakamura, do you remember last week when I said that they fought during the COVID time a few times? Shinsuke and Otis actually did good three years ago. And tonight, they did even better. Uh, but in the end, you know, Shinsuke Nakamura calling out people, you know, like, especially when they add a video, the vignette before the match, how stupid would Shinsuke Nakamura look if he did that vignette calling out someone, and then he loses to Otis. That's kind of like the testicle version of Zia Lee, if you really think about it. You know, and Zia Lee has turned in, become so predictable. If you saw my synopsis for, night, for tonight's show yesterday, it said Zia Lee knocks out another person. Because you could see exactly where, what they're trying to do. Is suddenly, Zia Lee, you know, is leaving people incapacitated in the ring. But this match was great. Otis eats not one, not two, but three Kinsashas. And that's what it took for Otis to uh, stay down. So in the end, Shinsuke Nakamura gets the win. This was a really, really good match. The crowd was into it. I enjoyed it. After the match is over, we get a backstage segment with Drew McIntyre and Seth Rollins. And Drew sees Seth and Drew says, look, I wanted to do something I've been wanting to do since Crown Jewel. And hey, you know, the better man won and I got to do what I always do. I got to pick myself up and work my arse off and get another championship shot. And Seth Rollins says, you know, I guarantee you will get another one, big man. And Drew extends his hand. Seth Rollins shakes it. And Drew McIntyre is staring at Seth as he walks off a little bit battered but he had just had a match with Sami Zayn against the Judgment Day. And then we had the post-match beatdown. Uh, Benjamin, by the way, speaking of Bailey, we talked about Bailey getting kicked out of Judgment of the Damage Control last night. So if you want to check out last night's episode, we talked about that a little bit. But uh, Drew McIntyre with the handshake to Seth. Seth walks off a little bit gingerly, and Drew McIntyre is looking at him. I wonder how many of you thought for a split second that, Drew was going to attack Seth from behind, especially when you saw that ladder. Did you see what Seth Rollins was walking by after the handshake and it was just a random ladder standing there? I honestly thought Drew was going to attack him, throw him into the fucking ladder and leave him laying. But it was early in the night. So it would have been kind of odd to do it that early in the night. But as of this point, handshake, and we're wondering, 
Where does this lead next? So, next match on the card, we had Piper Nevin taking on Tegan Knox. Natty is still in the corner of, of Tegan Knox, and this is going to lead to that championship title defense. This was supposed to happen in NXT. Uh, in fact, did, I think it did happen in that. No, no, no. They ended up going with uh, with Thea Hell and JC Jane because Tegan Knox got injured. That's what it was. But it's setting this up down the line for Natty and Tegan Knox to get the title shot. Um, this match was okay. You know, I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of tired of seeing the vignettes about Tegan Knox being known just for her injury. You know, the more WWE reminds us about her previous injuries, the more we're going to think about her previous injuries. And especially since it's risky that she could get injured again. You know, like, I don't want to think about injuries when I see her wrestle. She did good tonight. Um, in the end, what we kind of expected was going to happen, happened. And uh, yeah, Tegan Knox with the fruit roll-up on Piper Nevin. Natty got involved in it for a little bit Chelsea Green this is going to lead to a match now with Chelsea Green and Tegan Knox and then after that we should probably get the title shot for the women's tag team championships is is Natty and Tegan Knox the next champions I don't think so all right next Jackie Redman is interviewing the Miz in the back and the Miz is talking about his upcoming match, not only tonight, but it's Survivor Series against Gunther. And, you know, the Miz says that respect is what drives him to face Gunther. And while Miz is cutting his promo, he gets interrupted by Ivar. And I, I got to be honest with you guys. I got to be honest with you. How is it? that so many people that do podcasts and sites don't remember how much Ivar talked when the Viking Raiders feuded with the Street Profits. Remember when they were playing basketball and they were doing all those things? Remember the women's segments that they were doing? Like, how does so... Are people deliberately just doing that just to spark up conversation? Wow, he doesn't sound like, you know, that. he doesn't look... At, it, wow, I didn't realize he taught like he sounded like that. Where were you during the COVID era? Were you out getting COVID? Like it wasn't that long ago. I mean, if anything, what got me a little disappointed tonight was why is he talking like a Southern hick that's in a bar? Why is he not slower, methodical, angry, you know, just teppered? Why is he acting? He sounds like a hillbilly. I know what he sounds like. I've heard him talk, but why is why what's with the war paint and with the fucking sacrifices and the dark nights and all these other people and Valhalla is here and Viking this. And then you sound like you're you're a hick saying, give me a core's light and a and a dozen wings. It was just yeah, and the turkey leg. Remember the turkey leg? Psycho, you're right. I mean, I was just blown away looking at all these people. I'm like, wait a minute. You were doing shows 15 years now. How the fuck do you not remember with Ivar that he talked during the Street Profits feud? But anyway, Ivar shows up. He starts calling Miz a clown. You're not going to even make it to Survivor Series. Then Bronson Reed shows up, and Bronson Reed throwing a little bit of... Uh, you know, George jacking to both guys and Bronson Reed saying the only reason why Miz is getting a shot is because uh, Gunther, like he, you know, Gunther outlasted him and this and that. And then we get a kind of a little bit of an awkward moment with uh, Valhalla and Bronson Reed. Yeah, this is probably leading to a match between Bronson Reed and Ivar. And let me give you a little bit of smoke and mirrors about Ivar. I actually had this in the synopsis, but I deleted it because I didn't think it's really news, but it's something to think about. Ivar this year in singles competition is one in eight. Since he had that match, well, actually, I'll go one step back. In the last seven singles matches, 
Ivar has had. He is one in six. And since he had that breakout match with Kofi Kingston, he is 0 in four. So, yes, you know, you feel like, all right, give it time. He's going to catch on. This motherfucker has been in the Viking Raiders on WWE TV for what, four years now? This is not like somebody that just came in or, or somebody was just re signed that was gone for a little while. I mean, the smoke and mirrors. And then you look at Ciampa. Ciampa in 2023 actually has a pretty damn good record in WWE. But ever since they reformed DIY, talk about taking the air out of the balloon. It fucking continued again tonight, which we will get into in a, in a moment. We had a backstage segment with the Judgment Day. And, you know, Dominic a little annoyed at Damian Priest. Oh, I thought we didn't book matches for each other. Did, you know, and, you know, because remember, um, Damian Priest didn't like it when they were doing matches, you know, except the matches for him back in the day. Now Damian Priest is doing it. And then Rhea Ripley is kind of like, what's up with Damian Priest proclaiming himself the, the leader of the Judgment Day? But then Rhea says, all right, let's go with it. Let's go with it. You, let's have Damian Priest in charge at War Games. Now, my friends, if any of you out there that have watched wrestling long enough, you look at this storyline, Damian Priest proclaiming himself the leader of the Judgment Day, which was not well received by his teammates. And now Rhea Ripley says, you are in charge of war games. Um, if you're a betting man, wouldn't that kind of reveal that Rhea Ripley gave us the outcome of war games that Damian Priest has to fail, that they have to lose at war games and Damian Priest will be blamed because Damian Priest was the one in charge at war games. So I personally think with Rhea Ripley saying that Damian Priest is in charge of war games that guarantees a loss it guarantees a loss but something else the other members want jd mcdonough in the judgment day and damien priest a little bit hesitant we know about you know the issues with damien priest and jd mcdonough but earlier tonight when the we had this chaos once again uh J.D. McDonough took another quote-unquote bullet for Damian Priest, got knocked for a loop, had to be in the trainer's room, and Rhea Ripley reminding Damian Priest that, you know, J.D. took another bullet for you tonight, and it's time. You know, we will want J.D. McDonough in the judgment day. So Damian Priest tells Rhea Ripley, uh, all right, you know, but let me be the one to tell him. He's earned that. So Damian Priest is going to go and reveal the news to J.D. McDonough later on in the night that he is now a member of the Judgment Day. Interesting crowd reaction. I will say that. Interesting crowd reaction. Um, but the next match on the card, we had Zia Lee taking on Indy Hartwell. Oop, that's better. Keep, I keep making a mistake here. Zia Lee taking on Indy Hartwell. And, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I, I jumped one step ahead. We got to talk about this. Uh, Giovanni Vinci taking on Tommaso Ciampa. I hated this. It was just sloppy, awful, dumb, made no mis sense whatsoever. This was the jits of the match tonight. Tommaso Ciampa has Johnny Gargano with him at ringside. Ludwig Kaiser has Giovanni Vinci with him at ringside. Giovanni Vinci trying to get involved a little bit. Referee ends up ejecting Giovanni Vinci early on. So we go to commercial break. Vinci is all upset that he's being, you know, removed from ringside. Ludwig Kaiser is incensed, you know, based on recent weeks, that's kind of dopey, but all right, Vinci is ejected. Gargano is still there, though. So we go to commercial. We come back from commercial, and the match is going on, and the match itself was great. But the finish was beyond stupid. What ends up happening 
is Giovanni Vinci returns to ringside and hits a drive-by to Johnny Gargano. Lays out Johnny Gargano. This is the guy that was ejected from ringside. The referee turns around and looks at Giovanni Vinci, who just laid out Johnny Gargano. This is the referee that ejected Vinci from ringside. So what happens? You have Kaiser roll up Tommaso Ciampa, and the referee counts one, two, three. Storyline purposes. How do you put any credibility in a referee that ejects someone from ringside? The person comes back, gets involved, and the referee's looking right at him and does nothing. Does nothing. It was absolutely horrible. I watched that and I said to myself, I don't even think indie promotions would do something that stupid. It's just awful. You know, yes, I agree, Rick. The referee's placement was wrong with this, but the referee should not have even been looking in that direction. The referee should have just acted like he saw nothing, but he literally watched it, looked at the, at Vinci, and he could have ejected him again. I know it would have been stupid, but if he would have said, no, no, out of here, out of, I'm going to, de- you know, and then Kaiser rolls him up and then the referee could have reluctantly did the pin. But the referee, I mean, honestly, I hate doing this comparison, but if that was Aubrey Edwards, it would have seemed like regular everyday business. Am I wrong? It just came off awful on TV. And after the match is over, Vinci is happy. Kaiser got the win. And Kaiser, for some reason, is angry. Kaiser was not extremely thrilled at Vinci, even though Vinci, in the end, did the right thing. And Gunther, later on, as we teased earlier, kind of a little bizarre. That segment was a little bizarre. And they're doing that specifically so Gunther and Kaiser have a match in the near future because Gunther is running out of viable opponents. So the next match, and yeah, this we pretty much saw a mile away. I had it written in a synopsis. You know, sometimes people will DM me or they'll post a comment like, like, why are you writing that? It didn't even happen yet. Remember when I posted four, three, three days before SmackDown? the women's war games match and people are like, why are you putting Oscar with damage control? Oh, you know, I got to put a banner up and we knew that, you know, that was going to end up happening and it happened on Friday, but this match predictable as usual. And I'm a fan of Zia Lee. I mean, people remember in NXT, even when she was off TV for like seven weeks straight, when she brought to the main roster, I actually made a milk carton with Zia Lee's face on it, but I got to be totally honest with you. It does not look good when she comes out. The music is awesome. Her intro is good too. But when she's doing her thing at ringside, she looks right at fans and she does it mostly to kids. But when she first came out and she went, yeah, she looked at one boy that was probably eight years old and the boy cracked up laughing she's not intimidating this is not something where you zoom in on kids and they look concerned and they look scared this is not killer khan this is someone from where she's from Chongqing, china whoever named that town must have been piss drunk on rice wine because I say that fast 10 times, Chung Ching China. It sounds like, like, a, like a cartoon, like Hong Kong Fui. Chung Ching China. That's where she's from. She call, And I'm not cr- making fun of the country. I'm just saying. It's just like, like you hear it. It's like, from Chung Ching China. It's like, come on. It's, that just sounds. And then she does her intro. And the fans are looking at it. And they're starting to laugh. 
It's not intimidating. It looks like somebody cosplaying for Halloween. It's like if my wife dressed up as a ninja and she's like, what do you think? And then she opens up the door and she goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I just, if I were WWE and I'm a fan of Zia Lee, change it, change it. It's not intimidating. The kids are laughing. They think it's funny and it doesn't look good. And then she kicks people in the head, let alone Indy Hartwell. It's seven feet, two inches because she's extremely tall. You know, this is almost like the Mercedes. Mar you know, this storyline is almost like the reverse Mercedes Martinez. I think a lot of you probably forgot. Zia Lee knocked Mercedes Martinez legitimately for a loop. This is almost like that storyline again. She's got deadly feet. But for some reason, you know, uh, her feet must add gout or something for two years because, you know, where did it go? So she has the match with Indy Hartwell. And if you went and got a drink and came back, the match was over. Indy Hartwell could not continue. Candice LeRae looking all concerned. The referee calls for the bell. And then afterwards, here comes Becky Lynch. Becky Lynch says, no, we're not waiting on your time. We're doing this on my time. She wants Zia Lee to get in the ring. And they're teasing that they're about to brawl. Becky's about to hit the manhandle slam. And Zia Lee gets out of Dodge. And no, it's not happening at Survivor Series. But next week on Raw, we are getting Becky Lynch versus Zia Lee. It's a nice rub for Zia Lee. And give props to Becky Lynch helping a lot of the, the women that need a little bit of elevation. She helped Tiffany Stratton a crazy ass amount. Tiffany Stratton is so much better for it. Lyra Vicaria getting the torch, so to speak, passed to her in NXT by Becky Lynch. Becky Lynch helping Tegan Knox. Becky Lynch helping Zia Lee. They're using Becky Lynch the right way right now. And people appreciate it. It's almost kind of like what John Cena was doing for Solo Sokoa and even L.A. Knight. Yes, L.A. Knight is in his 40s, but L.A. Knight is still technically fairly new in the WWE. You know, in baseball, you can have a 38-year-old rookie. You know, you could be in the minor leagues for most of your career and you get called up and you're technically a rookie. It's not based on age. It's based on, you know, the, the amount of career in the, in the big time. So this is going to lead to a match next week. Um, then we had the backstage segment, you know, that, but the only thing that impressed the shit out of me about this segment, you got to go back and watch it. Shayna Baszler with, with her, her skills holding a deck of cards. I mean, I know that's old and a lot of you already know, it, but tonight, she fucking flips the cards and she happens to flip over the queen of spade. I am enjoying Shayna Baszler. Shayna showing a little bit of respect to her partner, despite what happened in the battle Royal last week. And then Raquel Rodriguez shows up and, you know, wishes her well. And then Nia Jack shows up and Nia Jack's acting like a little bit of a bitch mocking all three of them. And then we get a stare down with Nia Jack's, and Raquel Rodriguez. And if this was the Attitude Era, you would have 8,000 fans going, kiss, 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 kiss. Uh, they could have a match next week. Nia Jax versus Raquel Rodriguez. The only thing that was kind of confusing is Raquel Rodriguez made a remark to Nia Jax, something like, the only reason why you're not a champion right now is because no one has tested you. I honestly like had to think about that five times, and I don't know what that actually means. Like, you're not a champion because nobody has, like, pushed you or challenged you? Um, I don't know. Gunther trolled The Miz a little bit. Gunther talking about, you know, that The Miz has earned the opportunity to become intercontinental champion. And Gunther, in a league of, him, of his own, you know, doesn't take The Miz seriously. The Miz not happy with it. And the Miz is a little bit annoyed at Gunther. And the Miz tells Gunther, watch my match tonight. And, you know, the, the Miz, listen, we know Miz has no shot. 
And it's kind of interesting when you look at them side by side that the Miz is almost the same height as Gunther. Because of Gunther's attire, he looks a lot taller than he actually is. But Miz tells Gunther tonight, watch my match. And what we got out of the match tonight with Ivar is that the Miz is still the Miz, even though the crowd is behind him right now. The Miz will cheat to win. The Miz takes on Ivar, and as we said a little bit earlier, Ivar, a little smoke and mirrors with his record in WWE this year as a singles competitor. Bronson Reed is at ringside taking in the match. And Ivar and Bronson Reed have this little bit of tension between each other. And towards the end of the match, Ivar trying to impress a little bit, dominating a little bit, telling Bronson Reed, watch what I do next. And the Miz rolls him up, puts his feet on the top rope, not even the middle rope, on the top rope. Referee doesn't see it. Referee calls for the bell. And Ivar is so upset at what the Miz did. It's kind of like what we talked about last week. Remember when Miz won the four-way and it was Bronson Reed, you know, that that was on the one Bronson Reed and Ivar. One was tapping out, one was getting pinned, ricochet kicked out at the last second. We shouldn't Ivar have been angry at maybe Ricochet last week or Bronson Reed. He lays out Miz because Miz won, but technically Ricochet kicked out. I would be upset at Ricochet. Bronson Reed got pinned. I would be upset at Bronson Reed. So Bronson Reed, you know, tonight after the match is over, uh, Bronson Reed decides he is going to lay out Ivar instead. And Bronson Reed takes out Ivar. Not really much of a crowd reaction. I think the crowd just doesn't know who should I cheer for. After Ivar called the Miz a clown and you're not going to make it to Survivor Series, you know, it's hard to get the fans behind him, especially when he keeps losing. But Bronson Reed lays out Ivar, hits a tsunami to battle of the behemoths. I think we all would be fine in seeing that. And that's going to be setting up that match. But you know, I, in the end, I wonder who the crowd's going to root for. I, I kind of feel like they may lean towards Bronson Reed. You know, I think Bronson Reed needs to continue being that lone wolf, not align with anybody. That's WWE creative, obviously. So, Damian Priest sees J.D. McDonough. Damian Priest reveals to J.D. McDonough that you are officially a member of the Judgment Day. He gives J.D. McDonough a jacket. I could swear that was a Damian Priest jacket. Maybe it's a Judgment Day jacket. I don't know. I mean, it, it's probably a Judgment Day jacket. Like, why would Damian Priest give him a Damian Priest jacket? But he gives him a jacket. J.D. McDonough is really, really happy. Crowd with a little bit of an interesting reaction to it. And Finn Balor shows up. And Finn Balor is... Is kind of see the reason why I thought it was a Damian Priest jacket is look at the side of the jacket in this picture with Finn Balor. There is an S. There is no S in Judgment Day. So to me, it looked like a Damian Priest jacket, you know. But I don't know. Maybe I was wrong. But Finn Balor is excited that J.D. McDonough is in the Judgment Day, but they have other business that they have to tend to tonight. Finn Balor and Damian Priest have to defend the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships against Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso. So, you know, no dissension right now between Balor and Priest, despite what happened earlier. Damian Priest proclaiming himself the leader of the Judgment Day. And the match is next. <laughs> but before the match happened, I honestly felt like I was watching Dynamite. That's not necessarily a bad thing. We had segment after segment after segment in about 45 seconds time. Gunther sees Giovanni Vinci and Ludwig Kaiser. And for some reason, Gunther is ecstatic with Giovanni Vinci's help tonight. That Giovanni, Vin Giovanni Vinci did good tonight. He succeeded. And, you know, if you follow the storyline, this didn't make much of a sense at all because Vinci kind of fucked up a few times, but 
Gunther is extremely happy with Vinci. Gunther turns around and he's got this angry look on his face of Kaiser. If anything, Kaiser over the last two months has been the guy and Vinci has been pretty much a lackey. But obviously because of the match that we talked about earlier, they got to kind of force this. Gunther upset at Kaiser is kind of stupid. Kaiser won tonight. So that happens. Gunther walks off. Vinci walks off. And then Kaiser sees somebody. And Kaiser's like, what are you looking at? And it's in this year in Jinder Mahal. And they're like, no, no, no. We don't have any problem. We're just looking for Adam Pierce. So could this lead to Imperium? versus in this year maybe maybe i don't know if i really want to see that but hey they're back on tv and then uh it continues we see alpha academy in the back i thought this was a little play on top gun you need the need the need for creed that's a, it's it felt like top gun you know the creed brothers little comedy segment with alpha academy then the New Day show up. Then you got Akira Tozawa with another one of those NFL titles that WWE is shilling the shit out of. I still laugh that they're selling every NFL team except for the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's fucking funny. I mean, that's how petty it is. And, that, and that's the, on the AEW, the Khan family side of AEW. They're the ones that will not re allow the, the trademark and the usage of the Jaguars and do not want to do business selling these belts. So WWE sells every NFL team championship except for the Jaguars. But, you know, these are team belts. I like them. They're not too big. They're not too small. But Tazawa, once again, shilling because where they are tonight and Tazawa doing his dance that he's doing. And, you know, New Day is kind of laughing it up a little bit. You know, it was just like suddenly we had like 14 people. Think about it. You had the New Day. You had the Creed Brothers. You had Alpha Academy. You had Imperium. You had Gunther. You had Indusheer, Jinder Mahal. Like in, in a matter of two minutes, think of how much money they paid for that two minutes for all those people. All right. We go to the main event tonight, and we talked about it at the beginning of the show. We had Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso getting the tag team rematch for the undisputed WWE tag team championships. There's your Miz and Ivar match. And here's your tag team championship match. We had two commercial breaks. Match started early. Uh, they gave it enough time, but unfortunately with hour three and notoriously them being somewhere around 1.2 to 1.4 million viewers closing out raw I expect similar tonight. I think, you know, was there ever a chance that Cody and Jay were regaining it? No. It'll happen not too long after Survivor Series. I, it won't necessarily be Jay or Cody to get those titles, but Finn Balor and Damian Priest will be losing those championships. When they do lose the championships, that might be the final nail in the coffin for Damian Priest in the Judgment Day. But this match was excellent. Towards the end of the match, for a little while, we started to think, could they possibly do a title change right before Survivor Series? Cody hits crossroads, Jey Uso with a spear, and you know we think the match is over. And Finn is getting pinned, but Damian Priest makes the save. And we're now looking at the clock, and we're about 10.55, so there's only about five minutes left in the match. And Jey Uso is outside the ring, and out of nowhere, Drew McIntyre shows up. Drew McIntyre hits the ring, outside the ring, and hits the Claymore to Jey Uso. Crowd booing the shit out of Drew McIntyre because Jey Uso, arguably maybe the number three most over person on Raw. I think number one is Cody Rhodes. I think number two is Sami Zayn. Three is Jey Uso and Seth Rollins, despite... Them serenading his song, I think Seth Rollins is fourth, but they're very, very close to each other. But Drew McIntyre claymores Jey Uso, rolls him back in the ring, 
Finn Balor pins Jey Uso. Cody Rhodes is knocked for a loop. And then we go back and we see Drew McIntyre on the rampway once again. But this time, Rhea Ripley shows up. Rhea Ripley with a little handshake to Drew. Drew with a little bit of reluctance on his face. I think let next week, I, I do I think Drew McIntyre is joining Judgment Day? Honestly, no. I know some websites tonight, it's official Drew McIntyre's in Judgment Day. No. Remember what Cody Rhodes said earlier to Seth Rollins that the enemy of my enemy is my friend? That will be repeated next week. Mark my words. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Cody said that to Seth Rollins tonight. Drew McIntyre will say that towards the Judgment Day. The enemy of my enemy, which would be Jey Uso, is my friend. Do not believe Drew McIntyre will be joining Judgment Day. It would be kind of stupid. I, yes, it could be considered hypocritical that he so insists about the faction of the bloodline screwing him over. Now he's going to join a faction of the Judgment Day that screws everybody else over. No, this is simply the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Remember that line. That will be what comes out of Drew McIntyre and the Judgment Day. Now the question is, do they add a fifth member to Survivor Series? Do they add Drew McIntyre to that team? Or does something else happen next week on Raw that leads to a change to the Survivor Series team. So we'll talk about that on Saturday. Overall, I'm left with Raw, you know, enjoying a little bit of storyline progression. Some of the things a little bit forgetful, the DIY stuff forgetful, the Indy Hotwell, Zia Lee stuff, pretty forgetful. Uh, Miz and Ivar, I enjoyed. I wish Ivar would get a few more wins, you know, when you start breaking it down a little bit. But, uh, yeah, just remember that. People will agree with me. Remember, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's going to apply in this. And I guarantee no one else is saying that right now, but that'll that'll be what the deal is. Now, uh, very quickly, before we run down a little preview of the history show, and I got just like three audio clips, but I got something that goes against everything that's been said about ravishing Rick Rude since the week that he showed up on Raw and Nitro. Ever since people were running with that, I've always said the same thing, and I'm going to get to share it tonight. And yeah, there's a very, very horrible chant about China, not the country, but the woman, which you will hear in a moment. It'll be worth the wait, I promise you. But uh, I want to just quickly get into the preview for NXT and Dynamite. Dynamite, I'm fucking confused especially as the go-home dynamite to full gear. I'm fucking confused of what they did as the preview for this week. I will show you what I mean in a minute. But for this Wednesday's, uh, two, excuse me, Tuesday's NXT, we got Wes Lee taking on Baron Corbin. That should be a good match. We have the Alpha Academy, and they're going to be doing uh, that those, those sessions with Gnome Dar and... The uh, metaphor, this is going to set up a match as we talked about for the last two weeks. Uh, that's why Alpha Academy is still there, elevating a little bit of the uh, metaphor, which I'm actually warming up on. Never thought in a million years I would warm up on Gnome Dar. Um, I didn't even like him when he used to say Alicia Fox. Alicia Fox. It always sounded like something profane, even though he was saying Fox. But that'll be happening tomorrow. Maybe it leads to a match tomorrow. Who knows? The uh, NXT Tag Team Championships will be on the line. Chase University of Andre Chase and Duke Hudson will be defending against Tony D. Still pissed off. That motherfucker didn't take the picture with me last year in stacks. That's okay. That's all right. Then we have two matches to determine the next two slots in the... Uh, the Iron Survivor Challenge. Right now, Tiffany Stratton is the only one of five. 
announced. Now, remember last year how they had a round table on NXT with Hall of Famers? I think Road Dog was there and Shawn Michaels and a few others, and they were deciding who was going to be in these matches for the Iron Survivor Challenge. Well, they kind of doing it a little bit lazy this year. On social media earlier today, we find out that Amy Duma, Amy Duma decided the women's match tomorrow and the men's match for the Iron Survivor Challenge. So we're probably not even going to see her tomorrow. She just did it on Twitter. Roxanne Perez is taking on Lash Legend. I think we know who's going to advance on there. When you look at the uh, Iron Survivor Challenge, I think Roxanne Perez is a lock. On the men's side, I think this is a little bit predictable as well. Right now, Dijak is the only person in the match, but tomorrow we're going to have uh, Joe Coffey taking on Trick Williams. Uh, Lexus King will be there. They will continue that storyline with Trick Williams and Carmelo Hayes and everything else that goes on tomorrow. So that that's what we have to look forward to tomorrow. Dynamite, though. I don't know what it is. This is getting more often. You know how they always post the preview and it's got all the matches of what's going to take place on the shows. They always do it with Collision and Dynamite and Rampage. They didn't do it yet. They're getting really, really slow with this. This is at least the third time in the last six weeks that we're going into Tuesday and the lineup is not announced for Dynamite. What they decided to do instead is there's some video game coming out. And I guess they have a deal that they're going to promote this video game on Wednesday. And instead of giving us the matches, now I, they did announce that John Moxley and Wheeler Yuta, or I'm going to start calling the not so great Yuta. You know how we have the great Muta? I'm going to start calling them the not so great Yuta. John Moxley and the not so great Yuta versus Orange Cassidy and Hook. And then this is probably why we're getting these pictures. We're going to have tomorrow Brian Cage, Powerhouse Hobbs, Konosuke Takeshka, and Kyle Fletcher in a Like a Dragon street fight against Kenny Omega, Chris Jericho, Kota Ibushi, and Paul White. And instead of putting the banner up, hyping up Wednesday, they're giving us this. I guess it's supposed to like look like a cover of a Sega video game. I'm assuming that's what it is. And they're like infatuated with putting all the participants on these covers. And I'm saying to myself, promote fucking dynamite. MJF is going to speak. Oh, wow. You know, it's like, this is what they decided to put out. Like, it's supposed to be a video game cover, I'm assuming. And I don't know, man. Whoever is in charge of putting the previews out there, you know, start, like, getting off your ass a little bit. This is the third time in six weeks they usually are posted by Sunday night, and we're now into Tuesday morning, and they're still not posted. So, and I, Paul White, you know, I listen. I always like the guy, but he does not look like he can move around. We'll talk about Paul White on Wednesday, and Ric Flair. Thank God, thank God, Ric Flair has made it clear that he is not wrestling. He's not returning to the ring. Um. You know, Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan, a lot of legends. They'll always say, never say never. I always want to have one more match. Never say never, never say never, because they don't ever want you to close the book on them. They always leave the book open because they'll keep bringing it up. Oh, could this happen? Could this happen? Thank God after Jim Ross said that he doubts Ric Flair is returning to the ring, Ric Flair pretty much put an exclamation point on that. So, all right. All right, this week in history, very quickly, um, yes, obviously, we get to pay tribute. Eddie Guerrero passed away 18 years ago today. Uh, there was some great moments this week in history. Believe it or not, every single one of those Survivor Series events, there are 12 on your screen. We cover them all. In this week's episode. So all 12 Survivor Series that happened this week in history. And don't forget, one of them 
involve this. The World Wrestling Federation Championships await inside a triple threat match here today. Hey, wait a minute, there's... Uh-oh, Triple H getting right in Austin's face. First it was a rock, and now Austin. What did he spit in his face? Uh, Triple H now running, and Austin, taste, Austin is tasting the WWF champion. I don't know where they're, where they're headed, King, but Austin is tasting Triple H. What is Triple H thinking? First the rock, and now... Oh, wait a minute. There's a road dog and X-Pac. Austin outside here in the parking area. Parking her garage looking for Triple H. Yeah, come here, you little bastard. I did it for the rock. What is this? Wait a minute. Good God Almighty! For God's sakes! The car just ran over Austin! The car just ran over Austin! Stone Cold just got run down! Oh my god! Oh my oh dear. Oh my god! All right. Yeah, so we covered them all. Also, one of my favorite matches of all time. One of my favorite matches of all time from the New York Knockout from WCW, Clash of the Champions. The infamous match with Terry Funk and Ric Flair happened this week in history. This week in history, technically the birth of Mr. McMahon, Brett screwed Brett. How do you like The Undertaker with his jacket and it's got the American flag inside Always thought that was kind of goofy for The Undertaker, like the dead man with the red, white, and blue. I don't know. Just for me, it just came off. It didn't seem to click at the time. I don't know how Undertaker ever felt about that. Also, Trish Stratus is on the banner. Maybe Trish Stratus made her debut this week in history. We had a Hall of Fame ceremony. My One of my favorite, 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 favorite ECW events of all time, November to Remember 1995. Steve Austin in that card, Taz turning heel, Mick Foley and Raven versus uh, Terry Funk and Tommy Dreamer, um, the Dudleys. That was an awesome night. Absolutely love that night. But we continue. We get a little bit of clusterfuck, but this is what I was talking about with Ravishing Rick Rude. My friends, how many times in the last 26 years have you heard podcasts websites history buffs say that ravishing rick rude showed up on raw and nitro the same night yes raw was taped nitro was live you see something on the screen that no one ever brings up i have always brought this up since my hotline days in 1997, the year that I started, I covered this in real time when it happened. A lot of people don't know. Not only did Ravishing Rick Rude show up on Nitro and Raw that week, he also showed up in ECW that week. He was on ECW television two days before Raw, two days before Nitro, and if you want a little bit of audio proof, this is that week in 1997, Ravishing Rick Rude showing up in ECW, WCW, and the WWF. Because 
I've given you the ECW World Heavyweight Champion, Bam Bam Bigelow. You know, and we all have our 15 minutes of fame, and I'd like to take a couple of my 15 minutes to talk about the rights and the wrongs in the world of professional wrestling. What's wrong in the world of professional wrestling is Shawn Michaels claiming to be world champion when he never beat Bret Hart. What's wrong with the world of professional wrestling is for Vince McMahon to instruct a referee to ring the bell in order to rob Bret Hart of his title. But on the other hand, what's right in the world of professional wrestling is for Bret Hart to abandon the Titanic and swim to the refuge of the NWO. What's right with the world of professional wrestling is NWO's course to destruct WCW. What's right with the world of professional wrestling is for the NWO to beat the living sh shit out of the man called Sting. All right, we could, you get the idea. Three shows within. 48 hours of each other. Uh, we had um, in a, a really, really cool moment. A lot of people forget Kurt Angle, you know, just uh, starting out in the WWE. This week in history is that infamous match when he took on the good, the Godfather in, in Pittsburgh. You don't boo an Olymp Olympic champion. This is when Kurt Angle first started in WWF and his own hometown was booing the shit out of him. You don't boo me. He fucking killed it right at the beginning of his career. Uh, believe it or not, since Impact Wrestling is going to be all new, what's old is new again next year, they have a habit of doing big announcements for the beginning of certain years, because this week in history, they announced for Impact Wrestling, a new year, a new home, Destination America. This week in history, anybody remember when Chris Jericho came back to the WWE to save us? That's good, about 15 years ago, I would say. Who remembers the disaster Hulkamania tour in Australia? I mean, Ric Flair looks like he's 70 in that picture. How many years ago was that Hulkamania tour in Australia? That happened this week in history. Also this week in history, we had Grumpy Cat on Raw. Yes, Grumpy Cat. Thank God Grumpy Cat's not around anymore. Uh, the my One of my favorite video games of all time, No Mercy, came out for Nintendo, I think, 64. It was the BWO debuted at the time. And we also will finish up the preview for this week in history is this pair of wrestle crap. Anybody remember when Sid was making a fool out of himself in WCW and Kevin Nash was making fun of him as well? This week in history, 
Sid said this on Nitro. Listen closely. Hopefully, you will try to understand what Sid was saying. See this? You can wear any Halloween costume you want to. But you know and I know that you are only half the man that I am. And I have half the brain that you do. See <laughs> <laughs> and I have half the brain that you do. Unbelievable. And yeah, Oklahoma made his debut this week. Nothing wrong with imitating Jim Ross, but imitating the Bell's palsy was beyond fucked up. If you forgot, this was Ed Farrar this week in history, debuting in WCW, imitating Jim Ross, Bell palsy and all as Oklahoma. I see Lou Ferrigno Jr. over here, but I don't see Hoovy. You guys know where Hoovy is? No, I don't know. What is this? Hey, 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 what's going hey, on? Where was it? Oh, man. you want to have a big celebration? Yeah, yeah I'm celebrating. You want to celebrate tonight? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Tell you what we're going to do. We're going to have a big party tonight. Now, I know mid carters don't make a lot of money, what? but tonight I'm going to give you guys the opportunity to make a lot of money. What we're going to do is we're going to take Hoovy's pinata. We're going to hang it high above the ring. We're going to give each of you sticks. Now, you can beat yourselves with the sticks, beat each other with the sticks, or beat the pinata with the stick, because inside of that pinata will be a check for $10,000. Yeah. Oh, you guys like that? Yeah. 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 Beat each other's brains out. That's Get me brains. Right. Kill each other. Hasta la vista. See ya. Doors, ten thousand dollar check in that pinata. Who can break it and secure the check? And I've been told that Mike Kinney is going to get a word with Goldberg immediately following this match. And remember, top of the hour, Goldberg will go out for one on one Kurt Hennig. Top of the hour, and with Hennig's career on the line, these luchadors are battling for ten grand. Yeah, and that pinata is already fall, falling off. They don't realize it yet. You know, right. ten grand what you can do in Mexico, you can buy half the country. Hold on, hold, hold on now. Oh my God! I can't believe. Put your heads, you gotta put a headset on here. everything you've done, but you've always been beating. So scoot on down. I want the A team take over here. I'm here to reintroduce the world to Dr. Death, Steve Williams. This man is one of the most impressive athletes ever before seen. Four-time All-American from the great state of Oklahoma, football and wrestling. Big Eight champion, football and wrestling. Three-time Orange Bowl, one Fiesta Bowl, and a Sun Bowl. He's even wrestled the great Olympic champion, Bruce Baumgart. Now, what are you doing here? Are you trying to call a match here? Step aside. Let me show you how it's done. I now, you know we're all waiting for one particular moment. If you remember this, you know what we're waiting for. I replaced you one time. I... No, go ahead. And I replaced you too, son, so just scoot on down there. I can't believe this. It's a slug fest. It's a slug fest. Oh! Oh, look at that. Drop kick from the top row. That's how you do it. You got to speak in sound bites, son. You speak in sound bites, and that's all you need to do. Tony, this he's guy knows what stick. he's doing. He's got the stick. He has got the stick. Pinata! 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 <laughs> Who's that? Hoovy? Is that Hoovy? Uh, yeah. Hoovy! Yeah, I think Hoovy. it's Hoovy. Pinata! Oh! And he's down! Great uh, defensive lineman from Tijuana State. Oh, baloney. me. Tijuana State University. Baloney. No one oh, cares about those stats. Jack. Nobody yeah. cares about those stats. What? Everybody loves football, son. You Everybody. know all about football. I know everything there is about football. I've done everything. I've done everything in this business. Yeah, you, yeah. I've been a referee. Yeah. I've set up rings. I've negotiated talent. Burn bridges. I've, booked, yeah. I've been the greatest. I'm the greatest play-by-play -play man there's ever been in this business. <laughs> And if you don't believe him, ask him. Exactly. I'll tell you, son. You know, we got some hot action in the ring tonight. And speaking of hot action, 
I got my uh, my barbecue sauce going to be coming out very, very soon. Well, good. It's going to be on the store shelf somewhere in the next 23 years. <laughs> you know, I just thought about something. Just thought about something. He said that the barbecue sauce will be out in the next 23 years. It's out for 23 years, isn't it? I mean, that's what year was that? 2000? I think it was around 2000. We're in 2023. Doesn't Jim Ross still sell the barbecue sauce? Just light bulb just went off. Pretty cool prediction, Ed Farrar. All right. So that's pretty much it for this week in wrestling history. So I, uh, before I get out of here, I saw a super shout out come in right as we were closing it out. And it's not a wrestling question. This kind of hits me out of left field. Um, from Dirty Niner, 415, thank you for the 999 Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style al album turns 30 years old this week. Was I a fan? And if so, what's my favorite track? Um, I... Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, we all know Snoop is Mercedes Monet's cousin. and Snoop is a big wrestling fan. And Snoop has obviously metal, mellowed out over the years. So I can't hate on Snoop anymore. But I will tell you that when Snoop Dogg came out, I liked the song Gin and Juice when it came out. It was a very cool, chill song. And I remember the old cars in his music video. But, you know, when some of the songs came out that were really anti-police, I mean, I get it, you know, where he, he comes from and, you know, just the dealings with racism with police and everything. But, you know, it's hard for me to get into, you know, 187 on a mother. It's like, I can't. I can't. So, you know, I, I, I enjoyed some of his work, but there was always something that I didn't like about him. Then when he started showing up on like a lot of talk shows, a lot of game shows, and he became this beloved like person, like I always thought that it was a front that, you know, he was more of like a, like a street thug type. And I couldn't, uh, you know, get used to it early on that he was this, like, I'm not saying he wasn't friendly. I mean, street thug thugs could be friendly, but I always thought it was, okay, you know, I'm going to become a celebrity. I'm going to make some serious cash. I got to kind of mellow up my gimmick a little bit. As the years went by, though, I started to uh, warm up to Snoop Dogg. And now, 30 years later, you know, I don't think he's a bad guy in any way, shape, or form. I don't, I, and I could care less if he smokes weed or anything like that. I, I have a lot of friends that smoke weed for decades. It has nothing to do with weed, but um, when he first came out, was not a very big fan. Um, always thought that there was a little bit of fake about him early on, but as the years went by, I warmed up. Can't say anything bad about him right now. I really can't. So, But Gin and Juice was the only song that I could remember when Doggy Style came out, so. All right, I'm going to jet out of here. I hope everybody enjoyed this episode, uh, your Raw Post Show. Um, don't forget, tomorrow night, Kev and I will be live at 10.05. Uh, it'll be on DonTony.com on Wednesday. Then we got Wednesday Night Dynamite, and I think we're going to do an hour Wednesday like we did last week because that was not intentional. I just didn't feel well, and people loved it that we just crammed the whole you know, big show into one hour, just going by quick. So we'll do that again. And then uh, this Saturday, Don Tony show, I have some big topics to get into a couple of, uh, I don't want to say exclusives because, you know, it, it ultimately is going to come out, but some important details that do have survivor series implications. And what's cool about it is we'll already have seen SmackDown so the women's war game match should have been finalized. And we also got to figure out if Zelina Vega ends up being that final member of team uh, Bianca. So th there's definitely some shit to get into this weekend. So definitely won't be a boring week as far as wrestling, but I thank you all as always much love and uh, keep supporting Don Keep downloading the audio versions of these shows 
that's what keeps everything alive. I mean, honestly, that keeps us in the stats that keeps us, you know, visible and, you know, seen a lot of places and also, you know, really helps pay the bills too. So I'm out of here, everyone. Much love. Catch you all again soon. Be well. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a podcaster. For me to live any other way was nuts. To me, those goody good people who work shitty jobs for bum paychecks and took the subway to work every day and worried about their bills were dead. I mean, they were suckers. They had no balls. If I wanted something, I just took it. I ran everything. I paid the bills. I paid the host. I even paid the masked maniac. Everybody had their hands out. Everything was for the taking. We always called each other good fellas. You would always hear from somebody. You're gonna like Don Tony. He's all right. He's a good fella. He's one of us. But if you're part of my crew, nobody ever tells you they're gonna get rid of you. It doesn't happen that way. There weren't any arguments or curses like in the movies. See, your haters come with smiles. They come as your friends, the people who've claimed they care the most for your life. And now, now that's all over. And that's the best part. Today everything is different. There's lots of action. I don't have to wait around for everything like everyone else. Oh, I didn't get the vaccine? Fuck you, vaccine me. Oh, your delivery guy has COVID? Fuck you, feed me. Right after I moved here, I ordered egg noodles and ketchup. And I got spaghetti with meat sauce. I'm no longer an average nobody, while they get to live the rest of their lives like a bunch of schnooks.